I feel so cringe talking about this stuff, but like, YouTube is also about conquering your fears, right? So like, let's do it. for being extra. Welcome back to the second vlog. I don't know if we can call this a vlog. We're trying something new this time. This is gonna be a little bit more of a, you know, quality time, nice cozy chat with friends, between friends. My original idea for this video was to do one about the power of pivoting. We are on a certain path and we decide to like change or change direction. Sometimes it might even make us feel disappointed in ourselves. But I'm here to tell you, nah, get rid of all those ideas because there's a lot of power in pivoting. It can make such a vibrant, full, colorful, amazing life. And there's a little bit of beauty in like not knowing what's gonna happen. It's the spice of life. My journey in pivoting is a very full journey. So we'll start today with like part one. Let's get into it. I was born in Brooklyn to two Caribbean immigrant parents. Keeping it real, like I had a fairly like strict upbringing. I think about like, when I think about my upbringing, I think about like other um, kids of immigrant parents who like have all these rules. Like I wasn't allowed to go on sleepovers. Like education, school was premier. It was number one. I went to school, like normal school. Well, I didn't go to normal school. I actually went to a school for accelerated kids, but that's a different story. So I went to school Monday through Friday and then my parents legit had me enrolled in like a separate school on the weekends. So like on Saturdays, I was also going to school. I was going to um, an academy. It was called Elite Academy and I was there from like 9 a.m. until like two on Saturdays. And I was like learning like advanced math and like all that kind of stuff. Anyways, my parents were like pretty strict. I think which is common for kids of like immigrant parents in the US or in UK. It was basically like Harvard or bust as far as college goes, uni as they say in the UK. Yeah, that's where I went. <laughs> like I didn't really have much of a choice. Like you're going to college and you're going to Harvard and like period. <laughs> Plenty of stuff to unpack there, we'll do it in another video. And yeah, in my family, both of my parents, like they worked really, really, really hard to leave. Sometimes I like don't really like these loaded words. I feel like especially in 2024, that people will like add so much to words and stuff. But I'm gonna say they left poverty. They left poverty, right? In their respective Caribbean, Caribbean countries. So they worked super hard to get to the US and then super hard to like keep making it in the US, American dream. Both my parents worked hard to be in the medical field and for them it was like, yeah, you have one or two options. You're gonna be a lawyer or a doctor, choose one. I know that sometimes for like some kids with African parents, it's like lawyer, doctor, engineer. I don't, I don't think my parents like really knew what that engineer stuff was all about. Um, you're gonna be a lawyer, doctor, pick one. I literally chose law because it had less blood. <laughs> Ended up going off to Harvard for undergrad and spent four years there. And then after my four years at Harvard, I did another full three years to get my Juris Doctorate at another Ivy League institution. But this time I moved back to New York. So I was in New York City for that. And then straight from law school, I went into big law and I worked for like, like a pretty good, pretty legit law firm. Obviously I'm making this video because big law wasn't for me. Literally being a lawyer, like wasn't for me. Your girl loves to talk, she loves to advocate. But I think being passionate about advocating is very different from like lawyering. Mind you, I was a corporate law lawyer. I was doing like, if anybody knows what ISDAs are, like that, was what my job was. To this day, I can't even really tell you what an ISDA is. That's a whole nother story, but anyways. Um, and obviously it wasn't for me. I had always been a very creative girl and young woman. I would, had been probably singing before I could talk. I loved performing. I danced all throughout my childhood and my adolescence, my teenage years. I was a ballerina. I did hip hop, jazz, all that stuff. And I tried my best when I was an undergrad to like continue that. Harvard, for instance, is not a place that is known for like dancers or singers or anything like that. So that was interesting, like trying to find the right space for me there. 
when I had moved back to New York after Harvard and I was in law school, like obviously law school kept me very busy, but in the evenings or like on the weekends, I would jump on the train and head downtown to go to like jam nights. I loved singing jazz, so I would go to a lot of like jazz jam nights and stuff. Would meet a lot of very cool people my age who were also um, doing music, many of which were still doing music and are like doing amazing, wonderful things in music. Shout out to any of y'all that are watching this. And yeah, even when I was in law school, I even started a YouTube. <laughs> so like, I, I'm definitely not an OG YouTuber. I did it for like a few months, kind of felt like it wasn't for me and I stopped. Um, this was over 10 years ago. You won't be able to find that channel. Um, where I was singing covers and like all that kind of stuff. I was really extra. I was like doing full music videos and everything. Cause I like, I'm create like I have created expression that just wants to come out of me. So, um, I was doing a lot, but I don't know. I think that when you're at some of these institutions, these educational institutions, these elite institutions, um, you get so ingrained with like following the path. You get so ingrained. You, you don't even have to be in an elite institution. Just society does this to you that like, you know, thankfully in 2024, I think it's a bit different now for Gen Z. They got other problems, but, <laughs> um, back when i was growing up it was very much like go to school graduate get a college degree get a job get married have a baby you know buy that no maybe get married by the house buy the house and so i was quite precocious as a child but i was like you know good girl i did what i was told and stuff there were definitely there was definitely a price that i paid for that and things i'm kind of making up for now in my adulthood by leaning more into just like being me and doing what I want. But back then, like I had a lot of pressure, external pressure and yeah, I did what I was quite strongly told I like had to do. And yeah, I mean, I'm gonna keep it real. Like those kinds of choices will make you depressed, duh. <laughs> Doing something over and over again, which is not what you really want to do when you have something else that you actually really want to do is going to like make you unhappy. So I battled a lot with that. You know, I think I was very, very high functioning. So sometimes it maybe wouldn't be obvious. Like I had these like internal things that I was struggling with. Maybe sometimes it was, I was also real extra when I was in college. So maybe that made it obvious. Um, but yeah, I... <clears throat> yeah so by the time i had graduated law school started working at the law firm got barred in new york state i was just like something's gotta give like at some point i need to get off of this moving train that is not moving to the destination where i want to be like where this train is going is nowhere where i want to be I got, I gained a lot more agency when I started working at the firm because my parents helped cover uh, my education. Um, I did have some loans and by the time I finally started working, which was after seven years of higher education, I finally had agency because I could call the shots because I was making my own money, right? So I think for the firm that I was at, out of like all the firms I could have gone to, I do feel like it was the best law firm for me. At the time, and this is kind of funny, but at the time they ranked like quite high in diversity, but you have to understand in big law, diversity kind of means like two black people, like maybe one brown person, maybe like three Asian people, maybe like one Latina out of like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of associates. So, but also, I liked the culture at my firm. It was a highly reputable firm. Oh, guys, I'm so far removed from like the law firm life. But I think back then, like Vault is what ranked like the law firms. And my law firm was definitely like in the top 20 in the nation, if not in like the top 10. I can't really remember. It was a strong law firm. Um, and a lot of these super strong law firms, like for instance, like the top five, they would be known to have screamers. 
So I knew that I didn't want to be at a law firm where like a partner was going to be like throwing a stapler at me and screaming at me. And the law firm that I was at like did not have that culture. I have some partners that I like look back on fondly who were just so warm to me during the hiring process and continued to be warm to me while I was there as an associate. If I can make a weird analogy, like let's say I'm a chick who like doesn't enjoy eating apples, but like the apple that I did have was the best apple I could have had for someone who didn't enjoy eating apples. Yeah. Because I knew that the destination wasn't for me, like I had stayed on the train for so long. By the time that I was an associate at the law firm, I was like, okay, if you stay on this train, the only other destinations for you to go to are the only other track for you to kind of aspire towards is the partner track right because like okay when you're in high school and you want to continue with education you can aspire to get to like a very good university that could then maybe get you into a very good job or a very good uh, like master's program or whatever it may be there's a lot of like steps you can kind of keep looking to but once you're in the job professionally especially if you're at a law firm and you're in big law really the only other thing to kind of aspire towards is to work your way up the ladder which means like hoping to be partner and at the end of the day i knew i didn't want that life that life was so far from what i wanted so i just had to be honest with myself and i did what i needed to do for about a year i stuck it out but as i was coming up to like one year anniversary i needed to kind of leave now or forever suffer in silence and just stay on this train that I know wasn't for me. So probably about like six or seven months into my time there at the firm, I started thinking, was making a very like healthy salary. And I was like, okay, if I wanna leave, I need to like start saving some of this. And also at the time when I, when I started my law firm job, I had moved into this like super cute studio apartment that was a few blocks from Lincoln Center on the Upper West Side. I might try to insert a, a image somewhere. Very beautiful neighborhood. It wasn't as expensive as some of my other law school friends were paying for their first apartment after graduating from law school, but like it wasn't cheap, yeah. And for me, like the only upside to being at the law firm was I like, kind of felt like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm finally an independent woman living in New York City. I pay my own bills, you know, single girl working hard, doing her thing. And I felt like I was kind of living my little like sex in the city dream. You know, I had a super cute studio apartment, just like here at Bradshaw, um, in New York City. And I was working hard and like going on a lot of dates. That is definitely going to be another video I'm going to tell you about. We don't need a lot of time for that one. But I knew that if I wanted to leave the law firm and pivot towards a more creative life, which at the time definitively for me was like, I want to try and figure out how to do the singing thing professionally. I want to figure out how to do music. I want to be in the music industry. I knew that I needed to leave that apartment. A lot of times when you have like these law firm hours, but you're like trying to like look for an apartment, I would have to kind of like leave on my lunch break, go run to meet this realtor, check out the place, see if it worked. Long story short, I found a new living situation. So I wasn't even signing into a new lease. I was going to sublet. I legit moved almost a hundred blocks north from bougie Upper West Side to Washington Heights, where all my boutique was at, eh? Once I had gotten myself settled into that new place, it was a super cute fourth story walk up. It was a three bedroom and I took like, I had this little cute room that had an exposed brick and the neighborhood was just so different from where I was living. There were so many more artists, so many more musicians up in that neighborhood. So I already kind of felt like I was like taking a step in the right direction. And once I had that comfort of knowing, okay, now I live somewhere where my rent isn't super expensive. I cut my rent down to, I think almost like a quarter, a quarter of what I was paying to live alone in that studio when I moved in with two other roommates in Washington Heights. That basically allowed me to, to quit my big law job. I didn't make like an amazing financial plan of like saving that would last me like two years. I mean, keep it real, those savings last me probably about like six months. <laughs> Cause there's saving and then there's also like transitioning your mindset from like, ooh, I make six figures to like, now I'm not making nothing. I can't spend in the same way. I definitely spent a lot less once I lost my job, but like, you know, I probably could have made that money last longer if I was more diligent about like changing my spending. So then that, that set me up to be able to quit. And when I say, woo, the anxiety I had around quitting my big law job, 
it wasn't even like anxiety that I had because I didn't have something else lined up. I kind of just had a firm faith and a firm belief like I'm going to figure it out. The anxiety that I had had so much more to do what I thought other people would think about me quitting. I had anxiety about how my colleagues would respond to me quitting. You know, what people in my network would think about me quitting. Keep in mind that I did my undergrad somewhere where a lot of people go off to be like, well, a lot of people start rich. A lot of people, Harvard just takes a lot of rich people to start with. But a lot of people go off to like be very successful, whatever that means. What society makes us want to think is successful, meaning like having a lot of money and like so on and so forth. So I had a lot of anxiety about, I don't know, judgment from other people, which now I realize in hindsight is stupid. So here's my first tip. No one is thinking about you, yeah? Most people, like almost all people, are thinking about themselves. No one cares like what's going on with you. They care about themselves. When I ended up quitting, I thought I was gonna get so much judgment from like my colleagues and stuff because I, I decided I was gonna be honest. I wasn't gonna be like, oh, I'm quitting and I'm going to another firm, because I wasn't. I'm quitting because like I don't really, I don't really wanna be a lawyer and I like wanna go figure out how to have a life in music and as an entertainer. No lie, when I came in that day, when I was sending the emails to like the partners that I worked with, the response I got was so shocking. The number of like senior associates, wow, this is amazing. Honestly, you go girl, you were so smart for making this transition and doing this pivot early. I had senior associates who I worked with who had been at the firm for like eight years or so, who called me at my desk and were like, you are remarkable, you were an amazing lawyer. And even up to that point, I thought I was like an awful lawyer. You know, I, I was so insecure about, I didn't really, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I was so insecure. I kind of felt in my head, I created this weird story that people were gonna be like, oh yeah, well you kind of sucked as a lawyer anyway. So like, you should leave, good job. And it was the opposite. I got so many like kind affirming words about like the work that I had done, even to the point that even after I quit, one of my partners called me like three or four months later and was just like, hey, we have some work that we also would love to have like, a contract attorney do, like, would you be interested? Which was also very affirming. It was like, oh, I guess the work I was doing wasn't that bad after all if the partner's still calling me to do some work after I've left. Another senior associate was just like, go ahead, girl, you know, live your life. You're young. Like once you're on this path, you're really kind of just on it. And once you like, have children or start having a family, it gets very difficult to leave. You are young, you are single, you are childless currently. Move to Paris, live abroad, live your best life. Like people were so supportive. And so my first gem from this pivot experience that I had was like, stop making up stories in your head about what other people think that prevents you from taking action. Because first off, everybody has their own stuff they are more concerned with their own stuff than, like, than anything. No one cares. Ain't nobody think about you. That's the first gem. And on the topic of quitting, society can sometimes make us feel like quitting is the same thing as failing, and it's not. First off, ain't nothing wrong with failing. Yeah, any of y'all that listen to these like business success podcasts know that like some of the most successful people are like, there's nothing wrong with failing. What you just want to do is fail fast yeah take action so you fail fast because failing is inevitable so first off ain't nothing wrong with failing but secondly quitting is not the same thing as failing quitting is a choice yeah we're usually not choosing to fail right we don't usually intentionally like want to fail you decide to quit something sometimes quitting is a win because it's you setting a boundary it's you saying hey what i once thought was for me actually i'm realizing now is not for me and so i'm going to make this brave choice to stop going down a path that is not for me so i can sooner be on the path that is for me okay i had to take a quick break because i had a zoom call scheduled i wouldn't normally show this but i wanted you guys to understand why the lighting was all of a sudden very different <laughs> Had to set the mood since it was later in the day and of course give my little baby everything she deserves. Go ahead, girl. And we're back after a brief intermission. Okay, so where did I leave off? So then I quit and 
it definitely was kind of like bittersweet, but I was ready to go. I loved my office mate. And I know she's probably watching this all these years later, and maybe even her mom is watching it too. Um, and I had grown very, very close to her. So it was like super sad on my last day and I definitely cried. But the people who are meant to be in your community stay in your community and she and I are still friends even though we're an ocean apart. So it's all good. So yeah, I didn't have a job. I guess we can call it fun employment, but I didn't quit and become unemployed like just to have fun. I quit and became unemployed to like figure my ish out and figure out how to pivot my life. And quite frankly, once I quit, it was like the wild, wild west. I had no idea what to do with myself because up until that point, it's like every single aspect of my life had been planned and structured because again, I was following a path and it can be so daunting when your whole life, you basically are following an instruction manual. Maybe this is a weird thing to say and like, oh yeah, I know I went to Harvard and stuff, but sometimes I feel like I do feel like I'm an intelligent person. I do feel like I'm a sharp person. I by no means think that I'm like a genius or in that category. I feel sometimes that with these institutions that we have our children apply to or send them off to, you know, these these assessments that we make children take to see if they, you know, are worthy enough to get in XYZ program or XYZ school. I feel like a lot of that comes down to just like following instructions and following rules. How good are you at following like steps? I think I was someone who soared at following steps. So I definitely felt like hella lost, hella lost once I finally stepped off of the path. When you are in a place when you're feeling like stress and depression and unhappiness for a while you don't just snap out of it right so i also kind of had to work through that you know i was unhappy when i was at the law firm i was glad to be leaving the law firm but then when i was out of the law firm i didn't have all this stuff to keep my time busy with so the unhappiness was a like i had to face it you know so there were a lot, there was a lot in my daily life planning, in my weekly, monthly life planning, in my emotional well-being that I had to deal with once I left. That said, even though it can be scary to step off the path, this is our second gem, there is a freedom like no other that you gain when you allow yourself to surrender to the unknown. So it was scary leaving and I struggled with figuring out how to like make this, you know, professional music life I wanted to make. It's not like I had gone to, you know, Berklee College of Music or the New School or Manhattan School of Music and I had like this foundation or a community or a network of other musicians who also wanted to do music. I was this girl who had gone to an Ivy institution and was corporate and like wanted to go to the other end of the spectrum. It was very unclear to me to how to start that path towards like professional musicianship, but, but actually when I would sometimes voice these confusions to a friend of mine, she said to me like, oh, why don't you try volunteering? Cause she had done a bit of volunteering and she was like, you know, not only are you giving, but it can help you tap into a part of yourself that maybe needs to be explored more. And so I took her up on that advice. I signed up to two programs. So one of them, I think it was called like Our Friend or like Our Friend Indeed, um, with the hour being like an H-O-U-R. And it was a program that provided friends, not mentors per se, but like basically mentors, but they didn't want you to be like a mentor. They didn't want you to tell the kid what to do and like advise them and stuff. They just wanted you to be a friend to a child who had an incarcerated parent. Either one parent was incarcerated or both parents were incarcerated. Um, so I started doing that and I routinely met up with this really, really sweet girl. She must have been like 11, 12. Yeah, and I would just like do fun things with her. So sometimes I would take her to go see a show or we would go out to eat or we'd go get our nails done, you know, just something 
to provide companionship, to help her take her mind off of anything that was bothering her in school or in life or whatever you may have it. And then another volunteer program that I did, which was like right up the music alley, was I started volunteering with um, Sing for Hope. Sing for Hope was a program, and it still is. For instance, in New York, all my New Yorkers, if you're watching this, have you ever seen those really beautifully painted pianos that sometimes they'll have like in Grand Central Station or they'll have randomly in a park or on a street corner and anyone can go up and play them? So those are the Sing for Hope pianos. So the program that I volunteered with, they are the ones who get these programs donated, paint them, and then like kind of drop them off in all these different places in the city just for anyone to walk up to and play or sing. But the program that I was most involved with within Sing for Hope was their program where they have musicians go into hospitals and perform music for the patients as a form of music healing. And I did that for a little while. I really loved it. I had like a bunch of kind of like jazz standards and that sort of thing that I knew. Um, and I had a bunch of sheet music, but I would just bring my little Bose speaker and you know, I'd have like an instrumental track for like Alicia Keys. Some people live for the fortune. Some people live just for the fame. Some people live for the power. Some people live just to play the game. And I would sing also for your gainer. I was petrified, kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But I spent so many nights thinking how you did me wrong when I grew strong. And I learned how to get along and so you're back from outer space. Yeah, that was a biggie. Yeah, just stuff to like make people feel good, upbeat, you know, you're not coming in there saying sad songs, you're trying to make kids smile, like children who have terminal cancer, you're trying to make them smile, make them feel good, and I loved that, I loved that, I loved that. Whenever I was in these hospitals and singing, it was, a, it was an opportunity for me to also just be very present and not be wrapped up in like all of my BS and all of my nonsense. Not to sound corny, but it was as much a gift to me as it was a gift to them. And that's the beautiful thing about volunteering. I, don't, I didn't think I was gonna put this as a gem in here, but like, there's a different gem I was leading up to, but I realized in hindsight that like, in this time when I was kind of feeling super confused in my life, actually volunteering did a lot for me and it grounded me a lot. So that's always something that you can look into if you're in a place where you are searching. But the gem that I was gonna drop was gem number two. Oh, I think I already dropped, I think I already dropped it. So we gonna say that that whole volunteering bit is like a sub-gem to gem number two. There's a lot of freedom in not being sure what to do next. And when you're in a moment where you don't know what to do next, it doesn't hurt nobody to help somebody, right? So maybe you might discover a lot about what makes you feel alive or what fires you up or what you're passionate about by just taking some time to like help other people. I think also in that time, I was like doing a lot of songwriting. Um, I was bringing a lot of focus back to my music. I was still going down to the jam sessions and that sort of thing. But the reality is these savings weren't gonna last forever, right? So some months after I had quit and my savings were kind of coming to like towards the end, I was like, okay, I need to figure out work-wise what I'm gonna do. At the time, so in hindsight, I'm not gonna say this was a mistake, but in hindsight, I was like, oh, this is kind of, ironic but the most sensical thing was to do work that i had the skills to do and guess what i had the skills to be a lawyer i started applying for contract attorney work as opposed to being in a firm where i was working as a part of the firm i had a base salary i got benefits coverage like all that kind of stuff with contract attorneys you're just taking on jobs as like a per hour hire and you're getting contracted out to do this work. So I hit up a few contract attorney agencies. Probably the third job that I got, <laughs> funny enough. Remember how I said that part of my job when I was at the law firm was negotiating ISDA agreements. <laughs> I'm not even gonna try and explain what I did because like I said, I don't, I, know, I don't know if I ever fully understood it, but essentially like you have two sides on this agreement, right? So as the law firm attorney, like. I'm representing one side and then the other side would be a bank. And what's funny is my third contract attorney job that I took on was for one of the banks that I used to like 
counter negotiate against. So now I was in a contract attorney job and now at the bank that I used to be negotiating against. Sometimes I would need to email back my old partner. <laughs> it was wild. I very soon had a realization. I was like, did I truly leave my big law job where I was making a very, very healthy six figures plus bonus to essentially do the same work on the other side as a contract attorney for like a infinitesimal fraction of the amount that I was earning before. Granted, the hours were a lot better. I basically was working kind of like 9.30 to like five, but the work still was just not fulfilling. Yeah, and a lot of time that I was there, there also just like wasn't enough work. So like I would do what I need to do at the bank, but then like, in the rest of the time that I would have to stay until five o'clock, I would just like write songs and stuff. So I was always like being productive and like working towards something. But after I was there for a few months, and I think after like month three or so, I was just like, yeah, this whole kind of fill up your days doing something that just makes your soul feel bleh, is not for me and why did i go through this whole process to be financially stable to quit my job only to be back in a similar situation that's making less money clearly the money was never it for me but if i had this goal of being in music it didn't make sense that i was filling out my time lawyering so i left the contract attorney stuff behind and this leads me to my third gem or my third tip for anybody in a similar position is we're so easily drawn to what's familiar to us, even if it's not what we want. It's very easy to keep going back to what we know. And that was something that I realized when I found myself in this like loop with the contract attorney work after leaving my law firm is I don't even really want to do this, but it's what I know. And so we kind of have to resist this urge to fall back into a resting state. What's that? Um, saying or whatever by newton that physics thing like hold on i'll look it up in a moment just to make sure i'm correct but like a a an object at rest will stay at rest unless it's acted on with another force let me just get the quote right hold on one second okay i don't know if there's a first law of motion i'm not a scientist y'all so that's why i gotta look this stuff up first law of motion a body at rest will remain at rest unless an outside force acts upon it so what i'm trying to say is because it's so easy to, to fall back into a place that is familiar to us. And we have to fight this gravitational pull that brings us back there. If you want things to change, you have to put in the effort. You have to put in the work. If you have a tissue that's just like laying here and you're fanning it so it stays up and up and up and goes up and the place where you want it to be is up, you gotta keep fanning it. Otherwise, if you stop, the gravitational pull pulls it back down to where it knows to be, right? So we gotta do the work. We gotta make the effort if we want change. It was a big eye opener to me that I was so desperate to leave this place and, and you know, not be lawyering anymore. And then like six months later, I found myself back doing ISDA agreements at a bank as a lawyer. No, 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 no. That situation also like very much made me realize that even though the nine to five hours were a lot better than big law hours, which like, trust me, it ain't a 40 hour work week. Yeah, I'm talking weekends, I'm talking nights, I'm talking you got dinner with your boo or a potential boo or your family and you're canceling that stuff. So even though it was nine to five and it wasn't these like insane hours, Mm, it just might be the Sagittarius in me like I was just kind of not down for this I don't know get up go to work stay there at the office the whole day do the work come back like I'm just not a routine kind of chick in the words of our favorite Taryn Delaney Smith I'm a chaos goblin I thrive in chaos we move with it yeah we move with the chaos we get it done do I thrive in chaos I don't want to say I thrive in chaos because I don't want to like attract more chaos to a certain degree I also need like stability and stuff we all need stability we all need need a place to land safely right the nine to five just wasn't for me and you know what I just want to like clarify because I think we also have a current culture in 2024 with like nine to five socks and like I'm not nine to five blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying that yeah I think nine to five is actually there's a lot of predictability a degree of stability. Sometimes I wish I wasn't this person who it, the nine to five wasn't for, but I am. So I was like, mm, I need to figure out 
how are we gonna do this whole money making income thing, but me not have to be locked into the typical like nine to five. And I don't know what it was, if it was like divine intervention. I don't think it was divine intervention because this is not that like oh, of an idea. I guess after trying what didn't work, I was like, I got some skills. I know some stuff about the law. A whole bunch of other people out here who are trying to be lawyers, why don't I tutor? And so I applied to be a tutor for a big company. If any of you guys do any kind of standardized test prep and you think of like one of the five companies that you could probably think of right now, I worked for them. And I started teaching classes for the LSAT. So I was preparing people to take the entrance exam to get into law school. It was always something that was supposed to be temporary as a temporary means of making income while I was figuring out my whole life, professionalizing my creativity. I also found as I was doing it that I enjoyed it. And I, I spoke to this a moment before, but this is an example for me of the difference between advocacy and lawyering. So for instance, as a teacher, you're definitely an advocate. Like I'm trying to help these people literally achieve their dreams. I enjoyed being a part of that process and being a coach and being someone who could offer guidance in that respect. Even if their dream was not mine, I don't need your dream to be mine, but I believe in you going after your dreams. And if you put your mind to it and if you do the work, like humans can achieve almost anything, right? And with all the students that I've worked with over the years now at this point, I've always firmly believed in them. I've always made it clear of what they would need to bring to the table commitment wise. And if they could bring that, like I would help them. Anyway, so at this time I was teaching classes um, and even that in its own, I felt like I, I got insight into what teaching is. Granted, teaching adults is very different from teaching children, but I felt like I got insight into what some of my friends do when they're like teaching children, because when you're teaching a class and everyone's at different levels and everyone's at different learning speeds, it's like quite difficult, but you have to figure out how to make the most. I'll probably insert some footage. I don't know why I have footage of me teaching from back in the day, but I'll insert some footage of me teaching. You know, a class would be Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday, It'd be twice a week from like six to nine or six to ten yeah so it was a very it was a much more malleable schedule so it was part-time work and soon after i started teaching classes i began doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring and yeah it was good it was like exactly what i needed i needed part-time income to sustain myself while i figured out how to tap more into my creativity and eventually get on a path for professional creativity still spent most of my days having no idea what i was doing or what i needed to do to be a professional creative but you know I'm not sure if we can say much has changed. Just kidding. We've made it. We've gone a little further. Hi, puppy. Oh, I don't know if you heard that noise. Either she was laughing at my stupid joke or my baby is dreaming. I feel like she's beating somebody. She throwing it down or something, beating up some other dog in her dream or whatever. Because those are some pretty, pretty aggressive barks to be having while you're sleeping. Hey, you go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Talking too much. That's why. We back, we back, we back. What was it saying? Let me just make sure it's recording. I always do this because it sucks when you're like, yeah, it sucks when you're talking and for like 45 minutes and you realize, oh, I didn't record one damn thing. Okay, we back, we back, we back. So yeah, once I had gotten into the swing of tutoring, I actually really enjoyed the tutoring. I, I loved having um, like the personal connection, helping people achieve their dreams. So that, coupled with my Sing for Hope volunteering at the hospitals and also being uh, an our friend to um, this young girl whose mother was in prison. Like I was really starting to feel like, damn, I'm feeling a lot more fulfilled in my life. I know a lot of this is about, okay, how I transitioned from my six figure big law job to like becoming an artist. But at its core, it was about leaving that big law job, leaving a, a existence that was soul sucking to me to gain greater fulfillment in my life. It was a little bit of a journey, but I'm happy to say that, you know, rounding up a year after I left the law firm, I was in this like really good place. While I was in this really good place, happy with what I was doing to earn money, happy with having the time to um, dedicate to my creativity. I, I mentioned earlier that I danced a lot when I was younger, but when 
I think when I was in law school and like college, it kind of slowed down. But after I quit the law firm, I was back dancing again. I was taking classes at Alvin Ailey Extension School. I had like gained a real good group of friends there. I had like this little like songwriting circle that I would meet with every week. And yeah, it was, it was, I was in a good place. Still didn't have no man, was still single, was still dating, ain't nothing wrong with having no man, but I wanted a man, yeah. So like, that was still a hot mess. That was a hot mess. I promise y'all, there will be many a video about that dating in New York City in my 20s. It's interesting, when you start fostering alignment in your life, within yourself and with the world that you have around you, it is, it's wild to see how the universe opens up. While I was in this good place, still unsure of like a lot of things in my life and still unsure of how to move forward, this is when this little nugget came into my life. She's a rescue, I adopted her. A lot of people always ask me like, especially here in London, they're like, oh, did you get her from Battersea? Cause that's like a very famous uh, dog adoption center here in London. And I'm like, no, nah, me and my girl moved over here from New York. But the story of how Lily came into my life, there was so much serendipity in that. I wasn't looking for a dog. I had never had a dog in my life. Remember, my parents are from the Caribbean, so there was no way we were having any kind of animals in our house growing up, no pets. You know, the story of how Lily and I came together was really, Lily came to me, I wasn't looking for her. And that is just one example of many things that just started coming to me when I was, I made the effort to be true and honest with myself, with who I wanted to be in life, what I was looking for in life, then things just kind of started falling into place. Things weren't perfect, don't get it twisted, but things were beginning to fall into place. In this time after I left the law firm, I also devoted a lot of time to, listen, call it what you want. Maybe some people are gonna say it's manifestation literature or like, I guess the non-sexy way to say it is like self-help books. I dove head on into that. So I was reading a lot of um, Eckhart Tolle. I didn't start with Eckhart Tolle because Eckhart Tolle be dense. Yeah, I don't recommend starting with Eckhart Tolle, but I was reading a lot of him. Gary Zukov, Seed of the Soul. Um, a lot of Dr. Wayne Dyer, Marianne Williamson, A Return to Love. Woo, that book changed my life, my life. I'll put links in the description for these books that I've just mentioned, as well as a handful of others that I was also reading at the time that really helped me a lot. I wasn't just reading them, like I was taking notes, I was like marking up the margins. I had a separate journal. I was journaling a lot as well. It just put me in a place to be a lot more intentional about my life because I knew I wanted to change my life. I was also listening to Oprah's podcast, Super Soul Sunday. Ooh, that podcast was lit. I don't know, I don't think she's still doing it now. But back then, this was back in like 2017. The guests that she would have on there, the discussions that they would have, a lot of the books that I just mentioned, they were recommended through that podcast. That was a whole season of my life. And it was a very productive and very fruitful season. And I will definitely hands down say that that season, that manifestation literature, I don't like the word manifestation because now it's become kind of like, I don't know, not necessarily like a trendy, but overused, you know? Law of attraction literature. The OGs of law of attraction. What's the name again? Hicks, right? Abraham and Esther Hicks, I think. I'll put that link in the description too. Those books were a refuge for me at a time when I really needed it. And a lot of what I learned during that season of reading a lot of this law of attraction literature, manifestation self-help books. I feel like I'm still feeling the rewards of that now. Then, I suppose I'd also been in this Washington Heights apartment for about almost a year. And I can't remember exactly what went down. I might need to, uh, I think me and one of the old um, roommates from that apartment. I think we like follow each other on Instagram. I might need to hit him up and get in touch and be like, what went down? But something went down, I can't really remember, where we had to move out of the apartment. I think maybe, okay, remember I told you I was subletting and by the time I released the video about my New York City apartments versus my London apartments, the full story will be in that. But I think what happened was I was subletting. So it was a three bedroom, there was a guy in living in one of the bedrooms, he was like a musical theater kid. Two of us were paying the rent to him and then he was getting the rent to the landlord. And I think that for a while, the rent we were paying him, he was just pocketing. 
yeah, I think that's kind of what happened. And I think the other roommate found out and then told me, we were like, what the hell? But anyway, so coming up, I'd spent about a year in that apartment. And then I moved like maybe like 10 blocks south to Harlem, to Hamilton Heights, which I loved, 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 loved. And that apartment, I had put a lot of like love and warmth and care into. I painted, you know, it was the first apartment I moved into with Lily. But I think there still was like something missing. I loved New York. I still love New York. I will always love New York. Like I, I beg that there's no second guessing to my loyalty to New York. I do love New York. But damn, New York City is a tough city to be in when you're trying to like, when you're just trying to live. You're just trying to live, you know, especially in your 20s. You're trying to figure out who you are. You're trying to figure out what you should be doing with your life. Or if you have dreams and you're trying to make them, like New York City is not for the faint of heart at all. I never felt that way when I was in New York, but I remember seven months or so after moving into this new place in Hamilton Heights, I went on a holiday, and that holiday was in Europe. And I remember I had a great time in Europe and also had some like kind of crazy-ish that went down that gave me like a lot of perspective about like what I was doing with my life. So, you know, I had a bit of a life-changing moment as well in Europe. But when I came back from Europe, I just remember thinking like, damn, when I had to take my suitcase, and probably it wasn't even that big, when I landed at JFK and then took the air tram and then that brought me to the E and then the E brought me to, I guess, Penn Station. And then from Penn Station, I take the one uptown and I was just dragging this heavy suitcase up the stairs out of the, the I don't know, whatever station was by my house. Once I got out of, up out of the station, I then had to take that suitcase up a hill to get to my apartment building and then I had to take that suitcase up four flights of stairs. <laughs> I just felt like, damn, when I touched back down in New York after leaving New York, I hadn't realized how much New York was weighing me down in a metaphysical way, in a metaphysical way. So that I think combined with the desire that I had to transition my life to being creative professionally, the reality was, even though I had quit the law firm and I had moved on from that, so much of my network, so much of my immediate community around me in New York City was still very corporate. After people graduate Harvard, like half of Harvard picks up and moves down to New York City. So a lot of my friends, and my very good friends, and some of them are still to this day my very good friends, and I don't, you know, it's cool that we were different, had different desires, and there's no fault in that. There's no fault, you know, being placed on anyone. But the reality is, is I wanted something like different. I wanted a different kind of life from a lot of my friends. And I had like a deep desire to be around people who also wanted that and could maybe just understand it a little bit better. So a lot of my friends in New York City were either like, you know, lawyers or, bankers or consultants and like working at these very um, like corporate you know places like Goldman and Blackstone and like BCG and Deloitte and so on and so forth and yeah it's almost like I couldn't escape the corporate life because even though I had left it when it came to my day-to-day -day work I was still surrounded by it when I like went out with my friends so that's when it dawned on me that like maybe New York City isn't the place where like I need to be, which leads me to my next gem, which is my fourth gem, is when you start feeling a strong sense of what your soul is calling you to do, it's important to heed that call, but whether you have a calling or not, it is also so important to find your tribe. And I had the bestest of friends in New York and I still have the bestest of friends in New York, but like my tribe, for what my life was calling me to do was not in New York. We are still human beings, like we are animals. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. Um, I'm a fool. We're animals and we need tribe, we need that community, yeah? That also reminds me of Diary of CEO episode I listened to, not even that recently, I think this was like a year ago. 
and there was uh, someone that Steven, the host of it, had interviewed, and he said something that really resonated with me. Let me see if I can find the example, because I'm pretty sure I Instagram story it at some point, so it must be in my Instagram story archives. Let me find it, let me find it. Instagram's kind of on this BS lately where, I don't know what's going on, but some of the stories from my archive just like, have disappeared and don't exist anymore. I think Instagram needs to get it together for real. Like even some of my highlights, like I didn't delete that stuff and all of a sudden I have some of my stories from my highlights that are deleted. Okay, so of course I can't find it, but it was, Stephen was talking to this guy and he was just talking about how there's this like lizard when the, put the lizard in Antarctica and it will freeze and just like curl up and probably die. But you take that same lizard and you plop them in some, I don't know, wonderful lush location closer to the equator, like they thrive. And so what I am referring to about finding your tribe is also related to, you need to do internal work and we have to work on things to grow internally but also why keep yourself in an environment where you can't blossom to your fullest potential? Why rob yourself from an environment where you are better suited? Yeah, I think sometimes that can be connected to where your tribe is. Like that's been very powerful and has done a lot for me on my journey of transitioning from corporate to more creative and literally moving from New York to London. Which leads me to my last gem. I think especially in like the times that we're in now, it's also important to remember if there is something you want to change in your life, you fully have the power to do so. A big part of why I ended up leaving New York is because I was feeling very stuck. I was feeling stuck, you know, like I wanted things in my life to be different, not how they were, but I was feeling stuck and I think it's very important to distinguish between feeling stuck and actually being stuck. Because think of it this way, especially these times that we're in now, there are people in life who are literally stuck. They are physically stuck, whether it's like in an incredibly confined space or maybe they're stuck within certain borders or they're stuck somewhere where they physically cannot leave. Yeah, or maybe they don't have the privilege of a passport that can also get them out of a land where they no longer wish to be. Yeah, but I think for a lot of people in the Western world who have certain privileges, you know, places like the US and the UK ain't perfect. They got their problems too, yeah? But sometimes, in the Western world, we can feel like we're stuck in a certain position or in a certain place, we're stuck in certain loops and like life is unfair and you know, uh, I really wish it was different, but I'm stuck here. There are some people who quite literally or physically for whatever reason cannot leave the physical place where they are. For those of us that are maybe mentally stuck or emotionally stuck, there's work that we can do and sometimes maybe it requires help, maybe it requires therapy, maybe it requires a support system, maybe it requires friends, but there's work that we can do to unstuck ourselves. Our mind wants to trick us into thinking that we can't change our life or we can't change our circumstances and that is a lie. That's a false imprisonment that our brain creates for us, which is BS. I'm gonna leave y'all on that note. I didn't mean to leave you on like such a serious note. I didn't know this one turned into a whole serious thing, but I say these things because I need to be reminded of them as well. And as I mentioned, this vlog is actually just a part one of my transition from, you know, six figure salaried big law attorney to, you know, this creative living woman that I am now in London because there's so much that has happened along the journey. But listen guys, now it is officially dark. I hope that you can actually see me on the camera. I don't know, maybe I need to like get my face close to make sure they see me. My little bubby is done dreaming, apparently. She's done throwing paws in her dreams. But that means it also is time to take her for a walk because she needs a little bit of exercise and probably needs to go wee. So 
Thank you guys so much for spending time with me in my second vlog. I can't believe that. Like, yeah, we've made it this far so far. Second video. Um, there's so much more to come. So much more to come. And if you haven't hit the subscribe, I need to stop waiting to the end to say this. If you haven't hit the subscribe, hit the subscribe. If you haven't given the thumbs up, give the thumbs up. If you haven't done what else, do some other things. I might just put little notes throughout the video reminding y'all to subscribe and like if you want more of this also leave a comment down below if you have any questions on what i talked about if there's any more you want to hear about about a certain part of the journey i am more than happy to so let me grab my little bubba let wake my little bubba and i will see you guys next time yeah honey we'll see them next time see you next time okay yeah she's not, she said she said she good y'all and we will see you guys next time Goodbye.